Yeah, hello, hello to everyone. Okay, so just answering a few questions quickly. Um, can you do these for other subjects? Potentially. I'm not making any promises. But, yeah, there's potential for me to do for other subjects. Um, we, both, we are just doing um, theory for this. Paper 1. Just doing Paper 1. Um, setup reveal. I'll show you my setup later because I'll probably mess everything up. But I've got like a laptop on the right hand side. And I've just got my monitor. How different is OCR and LXL? To be honest, I don't know. LXL is a bit of a dead exam board besides maths. I did make a presentation. I'm dedicated to you guys, okay? Love you guys. And have you got any tips for English Lit and English Lang? Okay, I guess I'll probably say that quickly. But um, yeah, just memorize quotes. That's pretty much what you need. My stream status is not good. There's, <clears throat> there's a slight issue in my stream right now. Sorry, you're going to have to bear with me a second while I just fix this issue. Do, 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 do. Cool. No paper two, sadly. Okay, so we're only doing paper one. We're only doing paper one here. Um, we're only doing paper one because it's quite hard to teach paper two. And I don't think I have enough time to do it. Okay, we'll start in just a few more minutes, like two minutes. Uh, no paper two. This is just paper one. Yeah, I just like to reiterate, just paper one. Guys, can we just confirm? Is there any buffering going on? Is it like, is it a bit laggy? Because if it is, I'm gonna need to try fix that. Can you cover programming core skills? Um, I'll consider doing paper two. Maybe I'll consider it, but I'm not making any promises. Can you guys just confirm in the chat? If okay, okay, great. Perfect, perfect. All right, that's good to hear. All right, we'll get started in one second. Just going to have a quick drink. So basically, how this is going to work is we're going to go through all the content, and then at the end, I'm going to give some exam technique advice stuff. And there's an extra thing that I need to give, which I haven't put in the presentation. Because, um, yeah. Luke, Luke's here. Hello, Luke. Anyone got advanced information, Anki flashcards? I doubt it. I doubt it. If you're taking A-level, by the way, you might want to cover all the content. The business video should be available now because um, just uh, for reference, I did a business crash course earlier. So um, you should be able to see that now. Yeah, yeah I'll keep this up on my channel. Okay, I, thi I think we're going to get started now. Oh yeah, at this point, past papers is the most important thing, by the way. You might have to do some for J276 because this is like the updated version. But... um. Okay, yeah, I'm going to get started now. Okay, let me just make sure this is all fine. Okay, yeah, so advanced information. So a quick rundown. The advanced information was released by OCR. And um, with the advanced information, it's only for paper one. And it showed you exactly what was going to appear in the exam. So um, I sadly didn't include a screenshot of the actual advanced information here. But this entire like presentation is running through it anyway. So you sort of be able to infer. You can't find the business one. Okay, I, I'm probably going to need to fix that later. I'm very sorry about that, but I'll try and fix that later. But um, yeah, so with the advanced information, it shows you exactly what's going to appear in the exam. It doesn't show you what's not going to appear in the exam. It only shows you what's going to appear in the exam. So um, as it says here, yeah, you can cover other parts of the specification to help you understand it. But the main thing is that um, the advanced information shows you the areas being tested in 2022. So we're going to start with the architecture of the CPU. It's called the von Neumann architecture. So here is the CPU. We have the input device. Um, you should be able to see one else. The input device and the output device. We have the control unit. So that this is like the main part of the CPU. This controls everything. We're going to get into definitions in a minute. By the way, a lot of computer science is just memorizing. So you're going to need to learn all these definitions if you haven't done so already. Um, the arithmetic logic unit. So this does maths and all the logic calculations. And then we have the registers. So um, we'll need to learn a bit about those two. Memory is just RAM. Uh, random access memory okay so the fetch to code execute cycle look there's a lot of stuff on the screen i'll admit it might look a bit imposing but you know it should be fine so fetch decode execute so it works like a flow chart basically so the idea is that there's a task right there's a thing which the computer needs to do so first of all you need to go to the task you need to understand the task and then you need to do the task so just to reiterate you need to well, go to the task you need to get the task you need to understand it and then you need to do it. So fetch is getting the task. Decoding it is understanding it. Then executing it is doing it. 
And then now we need to go to specifics. So with the advanced information, I have a feeling there's going to be a five marker, which asks you to explain all of this. Do not be afraid, okay? Do not be afraid. I would highly recommend making a flashcard on this because um, you're going to need to learn all of it. But yeah, so at the bottom of the screen here, we have the different um, registers. So how it works is the program counter, I imagine it as like, you know, the post office. So you have the postman, he goes to the post office and the program counter always holds the address. So this is the location where the task is stored. So the program counter has that address. The memory address register goes to the program counter and it takes the address. So it goes to the post office and it takes the task. So hold on, I need to make sure I'm explaining this fine. Um, but the, the memory address is transferred from the program counter to the memory address register. Then the instruction which is stored at the address, so the address like the house, I don't know, where the instruction is stored, they go to the address, they get the instruction, and they copy it to the memory data register. And then uh, following this, the program counter increases the increment. Now, this is very important, and a lot of people don't understand this, the increment. Um, you don't need to know address and data buses, so we won't be covering it. <clears throat> but, um, so if the increment for the program counter is 1, that means it's going to have the address of task 1. If the increment of the program counter is 2, then it's going to have the address of task 2. So if the program counter does not increase this increment, it's just going to keep copying the address of task 1, which means the computer is just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, which obviously you don't want. So after it's fetched it, you now have the instruction. But now we need to know what, what does it do? What is the instruction? What is it telling me to do? Because we don't understand it. It's all like gibberish right now. It's probably in binary. So you're going to decode it. So the control unit then decodes it. So it gets all this gibberish and it understands it. And then the final stage is executes. So now that it's got the instruction and it understands it, it carries it out. And this cycle is repeated. So that's literally how a computer works. So it gets the task, it understands it, and it does it. Uh, so just to confirm, this PowerPoint or this resource, um, as soon as the presentation is over, I'm going to put it in the description and I'll put it in my Discord so you can make flashcards using it. Um, only make flashcards on the stuff I tell you to because you can't make stuff on everything. You won't have enough time. Keep in mind, both Paper 1 and Paper 2 before half term. So that will be a little bit annoying. Okay, a few questions. Do you need to know about defragmentation? Yes, I think so. Do the memory address and memory address register and the program counter both hold the memory address? Yes, so the program counter holds it initially and then it transfers it to the memory address register. Keep in mind, a register is just a temporary store of data. So it just holds stuff temporarily. Okay, cool. So now we're going to look at the registers. These are the four registers in the CPU. So as we mentioned, the memory address register, the memory data register, the program counter and the accumulator. So the memory address register holds the memory address. The memory data register holds the actual instruction. So the memory address register holds the address. You go to the address, you get the instruction, then the memory data register stores it. Now the program counter, that holds the memory address of the instruction for each cycle. So it's like the post office. I always remember it's the post office and it holds the memory address first. And finally, we have the accumulator. We don't need to know about this uh, CIR register. I don't know what you're referring to. Um, 1.5 got taken out completely, but defragmentation remains in. Hold on. Sorry, everyone's asking about defragmentation. You know what? We'll get to it when it comes. I don't... I think it's in. I think it's in. I might be wrong, though. Might be wrong. Okay, yeah, CIR, I don't think you need to know about. The only stuff you need to know about is the stuff on this PowerPoint. So if you just pay attention, then... Oh, so I sound a bit rude, sorry about that. But yeah, I've gone through the spec and just got everything you need. Okay, the accumulator. This one, um, I always like to talk about in the exam because often they ask for an example of a register. So I say the accumulator is a register and it stores the results of calculations from the arithmetic logic unit. So if a calculation is 1 plus 1, the answer is 2, the accumulator then stores this result. Cool. You're going to need to know what these things do. Also, the components of the CPU, so the things that we looked at earlier over here, there's the arithmetic logic unit. So this does the maths and logic operation. So arithmetic, everyone knows that arithmetic is maths. So yeah, that's one thing. The control unit, this manages the fetch to code execute cycle. So it manages like the flow of data, if that makes sense. Um, the cache, this stores frequently used data so the CPU can access it quickly. So usually when data is in use, it's stored in the memory. But if there's something which you always do use, so let's say FIFA, you're always playing FIFA, then it'll be stored in the cache because it's closer to the CPU so the CPU can access it faster. Okay, there's a lot of people like annoyed as to whether um, defragmentation is in or not. 
Um, so, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that later. And registers. So registers is just a tiny, super fast memory store. Cool. Okay, primary storage. So as we mentioned earlier, um, this is where data is temporarily stored and it's what the CPU needs, what the computer needs. So there's two types of primary storage. There's RAM and ROM. Now, in the spec, it explicitly says that they you need to know the differences between these two. So there is a potential for like a three marker or a four marker on this. So RAM is volatile and ROM is non-volatile. Volatile means that without power, it loses... Hold on. <laughs> when power is lost, all the data is gone. So let's say you have... Um, ooh, let's say you have a game stored on your RAM. As soon as the power is lost from the computer, it disappears. When you turn the computer back on, it won't be there ever again. So volatile is where when power is lost, data is lost. Non-volatile is where if power is lost, data is retained. So if you store your game in a non-volatile type of storage, then even when you turn the computer off, when you turn it back on, it will remain. Next, we have RAM. Um, <laughs> RAM. Sorry, so what does the RAM do and what does the ROM do? So the RAM stores the data, which is currently in use by the CPU. So when you're like playing games or when you're accessing a file or something, it's transferred from the secondary storage, which we'll look at later, to the RAM. And the CPU reads it directly from the RAM. Um, the ROM. So ROM is used for the computer starting up. Make sure you don't get this confused, by the way. It can be a little bit tricky. But um, so when the computer starts up, it looks to the ROM. And the ROM has BIOS. I think it stands for basic input output server. Basic input output something. And um, this contains, it contains the startup instructions for the CPU. So when this computer turns on, it looks at the ROM. It looks at the BIOS. And then the BIOS tells it what to check for. So it says, is the keyboard working? Is the memory working? Is this working? Is that working? Etc. So when the computer first starts up, basic input output system. You lot are neeks, you know. But I love you, no matter what. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, um, RAM is read and write. So this means um, that when files need to be opened, so let's say the game needs to be opened. We're going to keep using the game as like some example. But when this game needs to be accessed, it's written from the secondary storage, so like our hard drive, is written to the RAM. And um, therefore, it can be read faster. But with ROM, it's read only because it contains the startup instructions. The startup instructions are always going to be the same. You just need to check that a few components of the computer are working. So you're never going to need to change it. Um, you do need to know that sometimes it can change, but that's with flashing. That's where you like flash it. And um, I doubt that'll come up and that's more like advanced. But yeah, that's just one thing you can keep in mind. OK, virtual memory. So virtual memory is where when the RAM is full. So here we here we have the example. So the operating system is always in use. So it's always going to be the RAM. We also have a word processor app. So this is like Microsoft Word and we have a spreadsheet app so like Excel. So when things are in use, they're stored in the RAM. Now, let's say we want to open a game, but the RAM's already full. How are we going to do that? So the files for the game are transferred to the RAM. And then these two files, which are not currently. Can you see my mouse? I don't, oh yeah, you can see my mouse. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, the game is transferred to the RAM. But the things, we need to keep the operating system, obviously, because that's always in use. But the word processor app in Excel, because we're not using it anymore, because we want to use the game. These two are transferred to the virtual memory. So the virtual memory is basically where, when the RAM is full, a part of your secondary storage, so like your hard drive or your SSD, that's used as extra RAM. So that means um, we'll be able to play our game then we want to switch back. Then when we want to switch back to Word, we can do so. It'll be a little bit slower because it means it has to transfer from the secondary storage to the RAM. Then the CPU can use it. But um, yeah, it's just extra RAM pretty much. Do you let me know if um, you're not understanding it? But um, I can repeat stuff if you need. Cool. Secondary storage. So here is what the specification says about secondary storage. I'm using the spec, you know. I'm doing bits for you guys. But um, the secondary storage is needed because it's non-volatile. So as we talked about earlier, volatile is where the file is uh, deleted. Yeah, you can't access a file again when power is lost. But secondary storage is volatile, which means that even when power is lost, you will keep the file no matter what. So the three types you need to know about are optical, magnetic, and solid state. Um, the need for secondary storage, well, we just explained that it's, we need it because it's non-volatile. Suitable storage devices, we'll look at that in a second. So is virtual memory a physical place or external hard drive uh, slash disk? Yeah, so virtual memory is where you have your hard drive 
and you uh, you take a bit of the hard drive which is free and you use it as like an extra ram basically so it's slower but the disadvantages of virtual memory okay sure the disadvantage of virtual memory is that it's slower and that's because usually ram is just read directly from the cpu but with virtual memory it has to first transfer back to the ram and then it can be read so like um elongates the whole process process virtual memory is just secondary storage yeah virtual memory is just secondary storage Cool. Uh, you need to know about the advantages and the disadvantages of the different storage devices I'm going to look at in a second. So, um, yeah, here we have those. And, yeah, so in an exam, I remember quite a while ago, there's like a six marker. We had to evaluate which one is better to use. So either, like, capacity or, like, no, capacity, either solid state or um, magnetic. But, yeah, those are, like, the different factors you can talk about when discussing storage type. So here we go. Here are the three different storage types, magnetic, solid state, and optical. Magnetic is like, it's the hard drive that most people have in their computers. It's like this fat thing. It's got a disk. So how it works is there's an arm and on the disk data is stored. So it's in zeros and ones binary, which you guys should know about. But um, this moving arm reads uh, the disk, which spins very, very fast. It's like thousands. It's RPM. I think it's 7,200 RPM. But um, yeah, that spins and it just reads it. And that's reading the data. Solid state works using electrons. I'm not going to explain it because you don't need to know it. But um, I, yeah, I'll share this slideshow um, as soon as the uh, crash course is finished. Yeah, it's stored on circular tracks. Good stuff. You guys are smart, you know. Is that virtual box? I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, and optical. Optical is, is just a disk. So some people get confused sometimes with optical and magnetic because um, uh, they, they think like that they're, they're both disks. Well, they are both disks, but um, the magnetic disks are like specific and um, optical disks are read a lot slower. And uh, yeah, because of how the magnetic like disk sort of, you don't really need to know this, but how, because of how they're structured, it means you can read it a lot faster. But yeah, here we have some examples of magnetic storage. So you have magnetic tape. Um, I think I might cover it specifically in a bit, but magnetic tape is like a form of storage which is magnetic as just a long piece of tape and just on the tape has all the data stored. So let's say, for example, FIFA 21, FIFA, sorry, FIFA 22. I'm, I'm a bit behind, but all of that data is stored as zeros and ones. Everyone knows that everything just, if you go straight to the root, it's binary, but this magnetic tape, it will just be zero, one, one, zero. And it was such a long tape, but that's how that works. A hard disk, as we mentioned earlier, is like a moving disk and you have the arm, which reads it solid state. So there's three different types. You have SSDs, which a lot of people know about. These not, I'm sorry. Um, you also have USB drives. So do I have a USB here? I do. So here's my USB drive. This is solid state. And um, yeah, it's quite small. Solid state is very small because there's no disk or anything. And it works using electrons, which is pretty cool. And memory cards. Um, optical is just CDs. Uh, that's pretty much it. Cool. Yeah, people are asking. I, I might do paper too, actually. I think I will do paper too because a lot of people are asking for it. And obviously I give back to the people. <laughs> um, pros, the advantages, the advantages of magnetic. So as you know, everyone knows that magnetic is literally everywhere. So why they use so much? They're high capacity, they're cheap, they're reliable and have a long life. Those are the four advantages you need to know. So I'd make a flashcard on that. Yet yeah, this stuff here, if you don't already know it, I definitely recommend fl making flashcards on it after this. And I'd use Quizlet to do it, not Anki, because Anki is more long term. The disadvantages, slow. So <clears throat> comparatively, compared to SSDs, it's quite slow because it is limited. Like it's just a disk. There's a, there's a limit to how fast a, din a disk can spin until it starts to like mess up. And also it's not portable. It's wham. How are you going to get a tiny disk? Um, solid state. The advantage of it is it's fast. It works using electrons. This is like chemistry stuff. It's very fast. It is the fastest option. Uh, it's quiet because there are no moving parts. Two marker, why are SSDs good? Quiet, because they have no moving parts, that bang. And also they don't need defragmenting. So I think you guys mentioned that fragmentation, defragmentation is removed, or it might appear on a two marker or something. But uh, yeah, SSDs don't need defragmenting. I'm not gonna explain defragmenting, but SSDs don't need it. Okay, a disadvantage of solid state is it's expensive. Because it's so good, obviously it's gonna have a high price supply and demand guys okay now 
optical, the advantages of optical. So these are literally just discs. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, oh, hold on. Someone said something. I recommend you clear the confusion. Okay, 1.5 isn't removed. It just wasn't mentioned, therefore... Okay, so 1.5 system software will only have low-tariff questions, apparently. I'm not certain, to be completely honest. But yeah, so I'll, t I'll talk about it correctly. Um, I'll clarify later. I won't get distracted now. Okay, anyway, yeah, so the advantages of CDs is pretty self-explanatory. They're portable, they're waterproof, they're shockproof. Disadvantage, they're slow, because there's, there's like a limit to how fast you can spin a CD and read it. And it's low capacity, they're very low. So CDs often are like seven gigabytes, which is nothing. Yeah, let me actually give you some numbers. So CDs are seven gigabytes, um, roughly. Mag uh, magnetic is usually quite high. So you can get like, oh, that's really high nowadays. You can get 16 terabyte ones, which is crazy high. Solid state is roughly a terabyte or two, but it'll be quite expensive. Cool. Okay, units of data storage. So everyone knows about binary, obviously. <clears throat> if you go, so you have files, let's say your, your Word document. Your Word document um, is like, I don't know, housecaptainspeech.doc or whatever. But in reality, that is just zeros and ones. Everything is just zeros and ones in a computer. And the zeros and one actually represent the flow of electricity. I have a feeling this is a question that's going to come up, so keep this in mind. You don't need to memorize the amount of storage, but you need to know roughly. I would say um, it's a good idea to know roughly. Uh, what do you mean by shock pr uh, sh shockproof? Um, to be honest, I don't know what I mean by shockproof, but it says it in the spec, so I'm just going with it. I wouldn't... Uh, yeah. Yeah, SSDs are quite expensive nowadays. Okay, cool. Yeah, so everything fundamentally is zeros and ones. Uh, so the different units of data storage, I think I have a table here, yeah. But um, this, yeah, let me go through the table first. So 0 and 1, so those are bits. 0 and 1 are bits. And then when you get 8 of those, you get a byte. And then when you get 1,000 bytes, you get a kilobyte. And then it just keeps going up in thousands. So 1,000 of each, and it just keeps going up. So you're going to need to know these. You're going to know need to know bit, byte, nibble, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte. Cool. You're going to need to know those. And I can't really explain them that well if you're struggling a little bit. But um, I'm sure there are YouTube videos which explain it a lot better than I can. Yeah. Okay. So now you're going to try and want to understand this. So one byte is usually a single character. So like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or whatever. Each character is a byte. And then um, if it accumulates. So what's a thousand divided by eight? Is that like... I'm sorry. I'm going to have to use a calculator for this. Do, 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 do. Uh, it is 125. So if you have 125 characters, it comes to a thousand bytes. So yeah, 125 characters is a short email apparently. I'm sorry, I'm very, I'm a bit stinky at math sometimes. But yeah, so with a kilobyte, uh, with a kilobyte you can store a short email, and then with a megabyte you can store a thousand kilobytes. So a minute of music. To be honest, if you've like dealt with like. If you've used a computer before, you probably know about storage anyway, because you can see like on the right hand side, it tells you how big stuff is. You know, I'll give you a few examples to help you understand. So FIFA, for example, so a game would be roughly 40 gigabytes, 40, 50 gigabytes. HDD is a magnetic, yeah, because I have like a moving arm. But yeah, a game's roughly 40, 50 gigabytes. Um, Microsoft Word is probably like three or four gigabytes. Um, would be a few hundred megabytes would be maybe like a video. Um, a document would be roughly a few megabytes, and then it just keeps getting lower from then. Um, but yeah, petabytes is, you You probably won't need to deal with petabyte in the actual exam. I do love FIFA. For reference, I clocked a thousand plus hours on like every FIFA up until FIFA 21. And now I've become a neek. It's great. Anyway, one terabyte, that's usually the size of like hard drives nowadays. Okay, let me move on. Oh yeah, actually, when converting to bits, remember to divide by 8, because there are 8 bits in a byte. So if a question is using bits, because with formulas, which we're going to look at a bit later, to calculate like uh, the size of an image file, the answer you get is in bits, and you always need to convert to bytes if it asks for it. So keep that in mind. Uh, doc is probably kilobytes, it doesn't have a lot of images. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, numbers. Okay, now, this is where it's going to be a little tricky. I'm going to have to turn my laptop into its iPad form. I'm going to look like such a schmuck doing I hope I'll be able to do this. It might be a slight issue. Okay, you're going to have to bear with me for a second. 
Okay. Wait, hold on. Look at that. Okay, there. That's fine. Cool. Okay, now let's do this. So, we need to firstly do this by converting denary, deanery, deanery, to binary. So, we're going to start with the number 220. So, with binary, it works by going through, um, it goes up in, like, powers of 2. So, if you guys know the powers of 2, it goes 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048. So, 256... What we do is we set out a table first, 256, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So what is the largest number that 220 can go into here? It can go into, it can't go into 256 because it's too small for that, but it can go into 128. So what we do is we get our calculator. You're not allowed a calculator in the exam. Okay, I'm using a calculator now for speed, but you guys can do this like using normal maths so we have 92 so if you do 220 minus 128 you get 92 so we have a one here now we need to find which other numbers can be added to make 92 so 64 is the next number and 64 is smaller than 92 so that works so we do 92 minus 64 we get 28 so 64 is one of the values we're using oops um sorry okay we have 28 now. Now we need to make up 28 using the rest of these numbers. 32 is larger than 28, so we cannot use it. That means we stick a zero there. Cool. We can't use it, so we stick a zero. 16 does work because it's smaller than 28. So now we do 60, uh, 28 minus 16 to get 12. So we're using 16. Now we have to make 12 using these numbers. 12 goes into 8, so we do 12 minus 8. Get 4. 8 works. Hey, 4 is there. 4 is the exact number we need. So we can use 4. If we do 4 minus 4, we get 0. So now there's no numbers left, so we can just stick two zeros there. So there we go. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is our final answer. 1, 1, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0, 0. I'm going to go back to the chat and make sure everything is working fine. 9-bit binary. Sorry, 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 sorry. Why is everyone picking 9-bit binary? Okay, okay. Sorry, I did not realise. Oh my god. 256. Wait, could you guys hear me fine? Okay. Oh yeah, no, no, sorry, yeah, my bad, my bad. It already goes up to 128 in the exams. I use binary for personal purposes, actually, so that's why I've gone a bit ahead. But, um, hold on, yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah. Ignore 256. It was only there for exemplary purposes because I was showing that there wasn't a number bigger that 220 could go into. But yeah, there we go. So just to reiterate, you get your number, you draw out the list. Every single time I would draw out the list. So 128, 64, 32, and you keep going down. It'd be good if you memorize them, but you don't really need to because it's sort of common sense, not common sense. You could just get the gist of it. But you see the largest number that it goes into, then you minus it, and then you just keep repeating that process. Cool. I won't be able to do another example because we don't have enough time, but you can use YouTube videos to help. Next, oh, now we're going to move on to binary to denary. You know what? I'm going to use the same number. I'm going to use the same number. So one, z actually, no, I'm going to use a different number because my PowerPoint says a different number. <laughs> cool. So we draw out the grid again. 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. There we go. Let me move this a little bit. Just make sure. Let me just read some questions. Yeah, okay. Binary is up to 8 bits on J277. Okay, cool. But yeah, so now we have this 8 bit thing, and we our number is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And we have to convert this to de deanery. So deanery is the one that we normally use. So what we do is the numbers which have zeros, we ignore. Okay, because that's not important to us. The numbers which have ones, we look at. So 64 has a one, which means we're going to need to use it. So 64 plus, what else has a one? Eight has a one, so we use that. What else? Four has a one. And two has a one. So all the numbers which have ones, we need to add together. Cool. So we get what 
you can't use a calculator in the exam once again, but I'm doing it for speed and you get 78. So that is our answer. We've just converted binary to deanery. I think that's how it's pronounced. All of you guys were bashing me for it. But yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Now we need to do adding of binary numbers. So in the exam, I have a feeling, let me just make sure this is fine. Yeah, we're going to have to do, um, we're going to have to do hexadecimal in a bit. Are you guys understanding this fine, by the way? Just do let me know. Uh, hopefully we're going to finish at eight. I don't think it'll go on anymore. <clears throat> but adding of binary numbers, I have a feeling that we're going to have to do an addition where there's an overflow. So an overflow is where it goes above eight bits because <clears throat> it's limited to eight bits usually. So the two numbers which we're going to add together are zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero. And the other number we're going to add is one, 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 zero, one. Hold on, have I goofed? Zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero. Now that's fine. Okay, we're going to add these numbers together. So it's basically like simple addition. It does take a minute to get used to. I can't lie. But yeah, let's just go for it. So if it's zero plus zero, then obviously it's zero. So we're going to put a zero here. Now, one plus one, this is where it gets annoying. So like when you're doing maths, if it's like nine plus nine, if it's 18, you have to carry the one, right? So because the you can't get twos in binary, can you? You can only get zeros and ones. Because you've got a two now, you have to put a zero here. I have to carry the one here. So the one has now been carried. So because it's a two, you've gone up the next layer. So it's like, it's like going from the tens to the hundreds. That's a good way to describe it. So one plus one is zero and then you carry the one. But now we have one plus zero, which would usually be one, but there's an extra one. So we have to do a zero again because you have to carry it. We put zero here, then we put one here. Now we have one plus one plus one. So one plus one would mean um, you have to carry it. So one plus one would mean you have to carry it. But then the one from before we can use, we can actually use this time. So the one goes here. Now we have zero plus zero plus one. It's just one, so we can write that. So basically the main idea is if it's zero or it's one, then it's fine. But if it gets to two, then we have to carry stuff over. Now, one plus zero is one. One plus one is zero and we carry the one. And one plus one is zero and we carry the one. Now, as you guys were talking about earlier, nine bit binary, oh my God. This is dangerous territory, okay? So we have the eight bits over here and we have an extra bit on the end. So what do you do when you have an overflow error? You ignore the bit on the end. So we have zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And this extra one over here, we ignore. We say to you, okay, you know, I can't swear on here. But that one we ignore. So in the exam, if you get this exact question, your answer you put is this answer. And um, the next question will probably be something to do with overflow and you just explain what an overflow error is. Cool. Let me check the chat to make sure everyone has understood that. Yeah, you can watch after the live is over. Oh, OK, the brackets thing. Yeah. So um, I don't think brackets are that deep, to be completely honest. I don't think it's that deep. You can watch this after the live is over. I will be posting this. No, it would not output uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. So, okay, I'll explain what an overflow error is. An overflow error, well, the exact definition, an, uh, the exact definition of an overflow error that um, OCR wants is where the result of a calculation requires more bits than expected. So if the calculation should be eight bits and it results in nine bits, then there's an extra bit. And this usually causes errors with software and stuff like that. This is OCR. Yeah, if, if you uh, get asked when the overflow errors, you could say um, it causes a loss in accuracy. But like an overflow is where, so answers should always be 8-bit. It should always be 8-bit because we're doing GCSE. A-level gets a little bit tougher, but GCSE should always be 8-bit. So if it goes above 8-bit, it's an overflow error because the number's overflowed, if that makes sense. There's an extra bit. We can't be having that. I've never seen the zero 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 like answer. I, I always go for um, writing out the answer and then ignoring the extra bit. If they ask you for the answer for an overflow, how do you write it with or without the extra bit? If they ask it with the overflow, then you just write it normally. So you write the eight bit and then on, on the left of it, you just write normal. I wouldn't put it in brackets. 
Yeah, the result of a, an overflow error is where the result of a calculation requires more bits than expected. Where am I from? I'm from three different countries, and I'll talk to you about that later because it's not important right now. I'm a GCSE student. All right, cool. Now let's move on. We're going to use hex, hexadecimal. This is like the new trendy thing. So imagine like, what can I compare this to? Okay, so the original was Facebook. Facebook was binary. Yeah, Facebook was binary. And then Snapchat was de deanery. And our hexadecimal is be real. That's how I'm going to compare it. So we have the number 29. And we want to convert it to hexadecimal. So with binary, binary is base 2. Base 2. Deanery is base 10. And now um, hex is base 16. So... Do you know the list that we looked at before where it goes 1, 2, 4, 8, etc? That's because it's base 2, so it goes 2 to the power of n. So 2 to the power of 1 would be 2, 2 to the power of 2 is 4, etc. With hexadecimal, it's 16. So it'll be 16 to the power of 1 is 16. 60 to the power of 0 is 1. Um, that's just like some math thing. So if we have the number 29 and we want to um, turn it into a hexadecimal, we have to see how many 16s go into 29. So... Um, <laughs> okay, so 16 times 2 is 32, and 32 is clearly bigger than 29, so it can't be 2. But 16 is smaller than 19, so you can use that. So we could do 1. So we now do 29 minus 16, and we get 13. Now, with hexadecimal, once it goes above 10, well, once it goes above 9, we start using letters. So it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 is represented by the letter A. And it goes up to the letter F. So it goes up to 15. So um, 29 minus 16 is 13. So 13 would be A, B, C, D. So 1D, one direction. Cheeky reference. 1D is the hexadecimal representation of 29. Cool. So um, I hope you've understood that because this actually took me quite a while um, to understand. But hexadecimal is indeed... Hexadecimal is indeed um, uh, base 16. Now, let's move on to converting hexadecimal to denary. Cool, cool, cool. Let me get rid of all of this. A little bit waffly. How have you guys day been? I'm trying to make small talk with someone who isn't even there. It's great stuff. Okay, so A4 is the, den uh, is the hexadecimal. And we have 16 and we have 1. A and 4. So with this... We have to do, so A represents 10, as we mentioned, because it goes 1 to 9, and then it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G. No, it goes to F. <laughs> but um, 16 represents 10, so we have to multiply. So 16 times 10, because A represents 10, is 160. And then we have 1, and 1 just times 4 is 4. So if we add them together, we get 164. That was it. I went through that quite quickly, so I'm going to do another example just for you guys, because, you know, we love you. But um, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. So just to reiterate, with binary, you have to draw out the 128. So the highest is 128, and then you have to go down dividing by 2. 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 41. And it stops at 1, not 0. With hexadecimal, it's 16. You'll never have to go above 16 in GCSE. So I'll only have 16 and 1. So another example, um, you know, I'm just going to use a random number. I t okay, so I've used this number. I don't know why you know so we have that number so what do we have to do we have to multiply first so 16 multiplied by 6 is 96 and 1 multiplied by 9 is 9 we have to do 96 plus 9 now and we get 105 so hold on yeah we get 105 so that's our deanery number cool <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit all over the place. Yeah, hex is 0 to 9, then A to F. Everyone's put 164 in the chat. Have I done some math wrong? I'm sorry if I did some math wrong. So 1.2. Yeah, right. You don't understand this all. Oh, God. This is not very good. This is not very good. This is hexadecimal right now. We are currently doing hexadecimal. It's not very good. That you guys don't understand this but i will have to move on 
So if you guys are struggling, for A4, it's 164. 10 times 60. Yeah, it is. Wait, have I... What have I done? Oh, okay. I, I don't know why I did that wrong. But yeah, okay. Do you know what? I'm just going to skip over that now. After the video, you guys are going to have to do hexadecimal. I'm very sorry um, if I did do that wrong. I'll probably make a correction after when I upload the video. But I do apologize for that. Okay, next. We're going to do hexadecimal and binary. So you have to know how to convert between the two. And you have to know... Yeah, no, it's literally just converting between the two. So let's say we have the binary number. 01001110. Zero, 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 one, 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 zero. So this is binary to hex. So that's our binary number, and we want to convert it to hexadecimal. So what do we do? So with binary, I'm not going to explain it too well, but you could split the binary up into fours when it comes to hexadecimal, which is quite useful. So now we have to see what this represents and what this represents. So if we remember, it was um, 128, 64, 32. Because there's only four, we have to start it like this. So we have to do one, two, four, eight. One, two, four, eight. So just to confirm, when you're using hexadecimal and binary, you can split the binary up into two separate sections. And that's because it's a nibble. It represents one byte. So, sorry, that does not look anything like an eight, but it's fine. So now, if we want to convert that number, we just have to add them up. So whichever ones have ones beneath them, we need to add. So eight, four, and two, we need to add to get 14, but we ignore the one because that's a zero. And with this one, it's only the four, which has a one beneath it, so that's a one. Now, 4 and 1, it's a little bit weird with this. We just convert it straight up. So 1 in hexadecimal is 1. And 14 in hexadecimal is E. So we're left with 1 E. So this is a bit weird. But basically, the concept is that you split it up into two separate sections, convert it into denary, and then from then... Um, you just get the representation, uh, the hexadecimal representation. Um, yeah, that's probably quite botched, but I'm going to have to find that. Okay, now we're going to end this off, like the, the data representation 1.2, with A4, the one which has cursed me apparently because I got it wrong last time. Very sorry about that once again. But um, 16, 1, we have A4. Now, how are we going to convert this into binary? The annoying thing about this is we pretty much just have to convert it to denary and then convert it to binary. So we have to do 16 times 10, which is 160. Then we have to do 1 times 4, which is 4. We need to add them together to get 164. Now we have to convert 164 into binary. Hold on. Oopsie. 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. So obviously it's 8 bit. <clears throat> 164 goes into 128. So we do 164 minus 128 to get 36. So one of the 128s is being used. Um, 36 does not go into 64 because it's too large. So we have to make a zero there. 36 does go into 32 because it's larger. So we use that. And we do 36 minus 32 and we get four. So now we have to find four from these separate things. What we notice is that four is already there. We have a four which we can use specifically instead of having to use multiple numbers. So we can put a zero there zero there hey four there so we can use one zero zero so our final number is one zero one zero zero one zero zero that is our final number okay you'll be glad to know that i'm making you fail what okay hold on wait a second wait a second you know i should have had the stream up because i think i've been goofing a little bit and I am very sorry about this. Okay. I don't get nervous. Right, one second. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, this is this is my fault. I should not have made a mistake. I'm meant to be the guy teaching you guys. Sorry, one second. I'm going to have to edit all of this out because this is very, very embarrassing. Okay, so what are you guys saying in the chat? It was 4E, not 1E. Wait, uh, can someone clarify, please? Someone, uh, I said 1E instead of 4E. For which, for which question? 
Which, which, what was the uh, translation? Sorry, what was the conversion? No, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry, it's my fault. You convert 69 hex in wrong. Okay, so 69. So we have um, 16 and we will have 1. So 69 divided by 16. We get 4. And then we do 69 minus uh, 16 times 4, which is 64. And we get 5. 16 times 4 is... 64, so we got 45. Wait, what? You guys are bugging. I'm, I'm, hold on, I'm, no, I'm bugging somehow. From binary to hexadecimal, it was wrong. Okay, so I'm just going to clarify this because I really don't want people to be getting this stuff wrong. I do not want to be the cause of people getting this wrong. Uh, if you're still there, Ollie, moderator, can you quickly... 69 to binary was wrong. 60, okay, 69 hex to binary is wrong. Okay, cool, cool, cool. You guys have all clarified. Okay, 69 to binary. This is so embarrassing. Okay, so we have 16 and we have 1 here. So this was 4 and this was uh, 64, 69 minus 64 is equal to 5. So this is 45 and now we have to convert this into binary. So 45 converted into binary. So we have 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Um, 64 obviously doesn't go into 128. It doesn't go into... So 45 minus 32, we have 13. So we go into 32 because it's smaller. We have 30, we have to make 13. Uh, 16 is too large, so zero there, but it goes into eight. 13 minus eight, we have five now, goes into four, doesn't get to that, so there's that. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. <sighs> okay. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna move on, I'm gonna move on. I am very sorry about this. I do apologize. I'm going to clarify everything after. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, you know, this is the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. I'm not even joking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Sorry, guys. Make sure. Okay, everyone who's just witnessed that, that witnessed that monstrosity, you're going to need to go home. You're already home. You're going to need to... um. Uh, you know, just watch YouTube videos on it. Okay, anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, binary shifts. Yeah, binary shifts are easy. It's literally shifting. So if it's one shift to the right, you put a zero in the front, and then you shift all the other numbers, and the number, the number on the very right, you get rid of. So we have a little diagram here, which shows it a lot better than I can. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not stressing. I just don't want to, I want to make sure that no one gets this wrong, and I don't want to be the result of someone getting this wrong, because obviously I'm here to be helping you. But, um... Yeah, cool. Let me close that down. Okay, yeah, this is fine. Yeah, so if you shift it to the left, um, you, you shift all the numbers to the left and you add a zero to the front. And if you shift it to the right, you shift all the numbers to the right and um, you add a zero on the front. But the number which... Um, so if you have an 8-bit number, if you shift it to the left, you add a zero to the front, right? That means the number on the very left you have to get rid of because you can't have it 9-bit. And um, if you're shifting right, you add a zero to the left, you have to get rid of the number at the front. If it's right, then you go right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's right, then you go right, pretty much. Okay, cool. Characters. Now, there are two different types of character sets. There's ASCII and there's Unicode. Unicode, I use the word uni to relate to universe, so it's universal. Like, Unicode represents absolutely everything. Different languages, emojis, it does it all. ASCII is a lot more limited. But ASCII is, I think, more commonly used. But it sort of depends. So, um, yeah, ASCII is more commonly used and Unicode tries to cover everything. So in the exam, um, there's been questions where they ask, like, what's another character set? So it tells you one and then you have to give another. ASCII is 7-bit, but it adds an extra bit at the front uh, just so it's 8-bit because 8-bit is just easy to use generally. With Unicode, there are multiple bytes per character, which means it's a very high bit. You don't need to know how much exactly. But, yeah. Okay, now... Um, we're going to look at representation. So on the left side of the screen here, you should be able to see my mouse fine. Um, A is representative of 0001. This is just an example. And if it's like the next letter, then it will literally just be one value added. So it'll be 0002. That's pretty much how it works. That's how it'd be represented like in denary. If it was binary, it'd be, because it's only ones and zeros, it'd be 0001. The next one would be 0010. 
Doesn't the spec say the ASCII used in exams is extended ASCII, eight bits? So this was a very big issue in my class, actually. We had a bit of a annoyance over this um, when we did a exam. Oh, okay, there's, this, there's some weird people in the chat today. It's a little bit annoying. Do, 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 do. Just fixing that up. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, the ASCII used in exams, it's seven bit, but that had an extra bit to the front. And that converts it into a byte. That's pretty much what you need to know. This is just computer science paper one. So interestingly, on your keyboard, every single character, you're not oh, an extended as eight bits, yeah. So on this keyboard, you have um, all these different keys, right? And each key has a binary representation. So let's say the letter M, it will have a binary representation. So when you click it, although we're clicking the letter M, um, on the actual computer, it will just receive a binary signal. Then it'll input it to like a word processor. Ken, oh, hello, Ken. Did expect Ken here. Ken is a fellow study tuber guy. Hello, you're on the toilet. Exciting. This is only covering uh, paper one content. Um, I'll put all the stuff, all the resources and stuff that I've made. I'm going to put it all um, available for you guys. I'm going to answer a few questions quickly so you guys can understand this better. Unicode might be more common. I'm not certain. Um, if you give Unicode as an example, they ask you to give another example. Then you give ASCII. Yeah, perfect. The only two character sets which you should talk about in the exam are ASCII and Unicode. If you try and talk about another one, you won't get the mark, sadly. Um, data representation is on paper one now. Yes. They changed it. Initially, used to be in paper two. All right, cool. Yeah, so down here, um, we can find the maximum number of characters that each data set can represent using the number of bits. So 0001 is the number one. 0001 is the number one. So not eight. I don't know where you got eight from. Um, my brother is messaging me. This is great. Yeah, 1000 is eight. We'll go through exam papers. You know what? We'll do that at the end. Why not? Um, I'll literally, as soon as the live is finished, I'll upload everything. But um, yeah, to find the maximum number of characters each can represent, you need to use the ma um, the bit value. So as we mentioned earlier, ASCII can is use ASCII uses seven bit and adds an extra bit to the front because it's just extra and it's always zero. We can ignore that. So ASCII is seven bit for the most part. So we get two and we do it to the power of seven, and that tells you the maximum numbers, maximum like different values that ASCII can represent, and that's 128. So in the ASCII character set. There's 128 different values. See ya, some people. Of, um, okay, apparently there are people doing racist stuff. We don't like racism, guys. Don't be weird. Okay, cool. But yeah, why two? So people might wonder, why do you find the maximum value by doing two to the power of the number of bits? That's because for each bit, it can either be zero or one. So there's two possible representations. So if there's seven bit, it'd be two to the power of seven. Overflow error and the loss of precision. Your overflow errors and the loss of precision, uh, technically it isn't coming up. Technically it isn't coming up. They're saying that someone's racist. I can't really see this though. I'm sorry about this. I will deal with it as quickly as possible. Yeah, I am going through it quickly. Um, but yeah, after this, if you have any questions, join my Discord, ask me anything. I have a lot of time to go through it. Okay, next. Characters. This is a formula which you need to need. Uh, why is... Which is why Unicode was made as ASCII didn't have enough value. Yeah. How is it coming up? Siad Ahmed. Okay, let me find this guy. I don't know where he's made racist comments. Don't see. Okay, I know. So people are taking uh, the mic. I think my Discord server. Okay, my Discord server will be accessible afterwards. Okay, I'm just going to ignore the uh, chat for now because I just need to make sure that people are learning. Okay, so the car uh, the formula which you need to know for um the file. The file size of a text file. So do you know when you have like um, word files? You want to find out the file size of that. So the formula which you're going to want to use is the number of characters times the bits per character. And logically, it does make sense. Because if you have five characters, and how many bits is each character? You could just multiply them. So it'll be five bits. So if you have five characters, each character is one bit. It'll be five bits. So here we have an example. ASCII is eight bits per character, technically, because of the zero at the front. Okay. The eight bit and the seven bit is a little bit annoying. But um, yeah, so because it's eight bits, we have to do eight. And if there's 250 characters, we do eight times 250. So we get 2000 bits. But wait, as I mentioned earlier, the formula gives you the file number and file size in bits. So if we want to convert it to bytes, we have to divide it by eight because they're eight bits in a byte. And we get 250 bytes. Cool. Cool. Will we have to rearrange it? I don't think so. Um, I doubt you'll need to... Um, Okay, I doubt you'll re, um, really need to rearrange it in the exam because it's not a math exam. 
but um yeah okay cool images okay now this is a bit tricky this is a bit tricky my teacher explained it very well though which i'm very thankful for shout out mr brown love him um <laughs> but yeah so to find the total number of colors we do two to the power of n and n is the color depth of the image so the color depth is the number of colors that could be possibly represented by in an image so on the right hand side here we have a color depth of two because for each one is two and we do two to the power of two because um each one can either represent uh, zero or one as we looked at binary is either zero or one so there's two possible values for each one uh if there's a color depth of two we do two to the power of two to find four and that means there are four possible colors for each pixel because you see here there are two bits but if there's only one bit then it can either be zero or one so it can only represent two separate colors if that makes sense so for this one there are four possible representations for this one there's only two and the formula yeah two to the power of n and being the color depth of the image now the color depth of images mr brown no 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 not the youtuber not the youtuber my mr brown's even better my mr brown is better yeah guys please pay attention our gcse is oh my god it's basically in a week okay existential crisis over um, images, the formula for the file size of an image. So you have the length and the width, that's resolution. So do you know 920 by 1080? Um, yeah, that's like a common one. But um, you do the length and the width times the color depth. So the length and the width is obvious because that's the number of pixels there. And then for each pixel, you need to know how many possible representations there are. So if there's two possible representations, then it'll be a color depth of one. If there's four possible representations, it'll be a color depth of two because two to the power of two is four. Cool. Um, when you actually use a formula, it'll be pretty simple. It'll probably just be something like this. We have the example on the left. So it'll just be um, 1920 by 1080. Yeah. Um, don't get sidetracked. Okay, yeah, I'll try not to get sidetracked. Sorry about that. But yeah, 920 by 1080, and then you just multiply it by 3, and that's the total file size. Once again, we need to remember to divide by 8 to get the number of bytes. And then um, here we have quite a large number. If you divide by 1,000, you can go from bytes to kilobytes. So if you divide this number by 1,000, we can do kilobytes. In the actual exam, when you're using these formulas, unless it explicitly tells you to convert it to like kilobytes or gigabytes, then it's not that deep. You should be able to put your answer in most forms, but just convert to bytes. Do you automatically give the answer in bytes or only if they specify? Yeah, um, most of the time it's only if they specify. So it's not that deep. Well, they typically ask for the file size in bytes. Yeah, I think usually they ask for the file size. If it's like an image file, they ask for it in megabytes or something. So you will need to convert. You will need to convert. Cool. Metadata is the data stored within an image. So um, when you have an image file on your phone, metadata is stored within it, within it. And the metadata basically tells the phone, this is how you need to display the image. So it tells the, the phone the length of the image, the width of the image, the color depth of the image, and the file format. And it just makes sure it gets displayed correctly. This stuff is pretty much just memorization. So you're just going to have to memorize it. You're just going to have to make flashcards or something. We have got exam in a week. Can't forget. Okay, sampling. So the sampling is a process of converting analog audio into digital. So right now, as I'm talking, my sound is being sampled. So um, analog audio, analog simply means continually changing pieces of data. Um, you, you, I don't think you need to know about vectors. Metadata is data about data, pretty much. Metadata is data stored within, it, <clears throat> within an image. But um, here we have a graph. This shows the height of the wave. So this shows a sound wave, like from GCSE physics, and it shows the time. So as time passes, like every second, it, um, well, I mean, analog is continually changing, but when it converts to digital, it's slightly different. But yeah, sampling, simply put, is just converting analog audio to digital. So why does it do this? Because when we talk into a microphone, it's analog, and they need to understand it in a computer. The computer needs to understand it. Um, I, but yeah, vectors we don't need to know about. <clears throat> so um, this is a digital representation of this sound. So how the digital representation works is based on a sample rate. It looks at the amplitude of the wave at that point, and it just records it. So one hertz means one time per second. So um, if this is sampled with the sample rate of one hertz, every second it looks at where the wave is and it plots it, and then it just connects it like this. So as we see here, like I'll try and do it quickly so you can sort of see how it's moved. But yeah. Now the issue with this is that if things are like changing quite quickly, then it won't be able to pick up on it. So we can see towards the end here, from eight to nine to 10. Although it changes quite a lot here, over here, 
it just says flat because it doesn't take enough samples to understand it. But if we increase the sample rate to two, that means it looks at the height of the wave two times per second. So here we have two and it makes it more accurate. So the advantages of sample rate, there's two of them. It's, it's higher quality and is more closer to the original. So it's higher quality and it's closer to the original like actual audio. Disadvantage of sample rate is that the greater the sample rate, the higher the file size because there's more data being stored. Okay, my camera is covering it. Apparently my camera is covering it. Oh, no, it isn't covering it. It isn't covering it, I don't think. Yeah, analog audio to digital. Yeah, so sampling, the process of sampling is just converting from analog audio to digital. Now, here we have a full mark answer. I already went through the fetch code execute cycle, yeah. Here we have a full mark answer. So if there's like a three marker or a four marker about sampling, this is what the answer would be. So sampling is where analog signals are converted to digital. It works by taking the amplitude. Amplitude simply means height. And you should know this from physics. By taking the height of the wave at diff uh, regular intervals, uh, depending on the sample rates. So if it's one, is one time per second. If it's two, is two times per second. Then you just plot it digitally. And this means that the digital representation of a sound wave has been created. So um, obviously I'll upload this afterwards so you can look at it and you can maybe make a flashcard on it. Cool. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you can improve a sound file two different ways. So I talked about sample rate. So more sample rates per second means it's more accurate because it picks up on all like different sounds. And bit depth. So the bit depth, uh, I don't know if I have, or uh, I don't think I got a graph. But bit depth is where there's basically more possible heights of the wave at each point. So usually there'd be 10, but if you increase the bit depth, there'd be like a greater amount. So the advantages of both, that will be... Um, yeah, this is not in IGCSE, this is only in OCR. Um, the advantage of this is that it's better quality and closer to the original, but the disadvantage is the highest file size. Because if it's higher quality, there's more data stored, so there's a higher file size. To calculate the file size of a sound file, you need to do the sample rate times the bit depth times the duration. So example here, we have an audio clip, five seconds. Um, a sample is taken every five seconds, so that's five hertz. And the bit depth is eight. The answer is 200 bits, but if we want it in bytes, it'll be 25. Cool, compression. Compression is where you reduce the file size. Compress is pretty much common sense. You're just compressing something, making something smaller. So compression is where you reduce the file size while trying to keep it as close to the original as possible. You're quite literally compressing the file. Now, there are two types, and often they ask you to compare these. So there's lossy and lossless. So with lossy, you permanently remove the data. The advantage of this is that obviously it reduces the file size more because you permanently just remove something, like it's a lot smaller now. But the disadvantage is that it's lower quality and it doesn't work on all files. For example, if you have like code that you've written, if you just take like half of it from the middle of the code, the code's not going to work anymore, is it? Now, lossless is different. Always divide by eight to go to bytes, yes. Lossless is where data is temporarily removed but restored when the file is opened. So if a file is five megabytes, you can press it, it goes to four megabytes. But when you open it again, the extra byte is restored. And that's what lossless does. So, yeah, lossy can't work on a text file because it just won't work because um, you lose some of the text and text is integral to the text file. So the disadvantage of lossless is that you reduce the file size less because you only remove it temporarily. But the advantage is that it's better quality, it's much closer to the original, and it works on all files. Cool. Yeah, so we have advantages, disadvantages. So the advantages of compression in general, four advantages. I have a feeling this will come up as a question, so pay good attention here. The four advantages are that it takes up less file size, it, less bandwidth is needed so they can be downloaded faster. Because if there's a 500 megabyte file and a 400 megabyte, then 400 megabytes is going to download faster. Websites load faster because um, less data is needed to be downloaded to access the website. And finally, it matches website file restrictions. So sometimes when you're sending emails, uh, there's like a restriction of like 50 megabytes. Um, so if you compress a file when it's usually 100, you could probably compress it down to be compatible. Cool. Um, next, the disadvantages of lossy compression. To be honest, there isn't really a disadvantage of lossless compression besides the fact that um, it's not as, it doesn't decrease the file size as much. So um, these are disadvantages of lossy compression. But um, with lossy, you um, the disadvantage what have I, which subject is this? This is computer science. Lossy can't work on executable. Yeah, Lossy cannot work on executable files. Lossy cannot work on executables. 
this. Sorry, the chat is slightly annoying. And the moderator is dipped. Luke, I'm going to make you moderator. You're just going to have to clutch up here. Another disadvantage is that it reduces quality. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, disadvantages. Uh, it can lower file size. Lossy. I. Okay, you know what? Just ignore the first one. I'm sorry. I wrote this. I made this quite late, but just ignore that. Second one cannot return to the original. If you've permanently removed data, you can never retrieve it again, so it can't return to the original. So you have a file, you've removed the data permanently, but you can't bring it back, so now it's permanently lower quality. And finally, it can't be used on all types of files. You don't, yeah, I don't think you need examples. I'm going to look at the spec afterwards and I'll put it uh, on the Discord, but I don't think you need examples. Cool. Factors affecting the performance of networks. Now, Luke, you're mod now, so just like make sure the chat's fine. But factors affecting the performance of network and networks, there are four factors. This is quite hard to explain. Can lower file size and not a disadvantage. Yeah, sorry about that. That was an issue. I, that was just my mistake. Okay, cool. Bandwidth. So the bandwidth is the maximum amount of data that can be transferred at a given point. You don't need to know the definition of bandwidth, I don't think. But um, it's, it's just generally good to understand it because it's quite useful. Discord link I'll put afterwards. So bandwidth is split between users. So let's say your bandwidth is 5 gigabits per second. Actually, let's say 50 gigabits per second. And there are 10 users. It will be split 10 ways. So each user, each user will have 5 gigabits per second. Um... So lower bandwidth is a bad thing because it means less data can be transferred. So if you have more users, so as we mentioned earlier, we have 50 um, gigabytes per second and there's 10 users. It was five gigabytes a second per user. But if you have 50 gigabytes per second and there are 50 users, then each user will only have one gigabyte per second. So the greater amount of users, the slower the network is. So that's the factor affecting the performance of the network. Secondly, signal strength. So when you're using wireless stuff, you obviously, obviously had a modem. You guys will know about it when you're in your house. But the further you are away, the weaker the signal is because everything's just sent via radio waves. Waves. So if you're further away, um, it, the signal will be weaker and therefore it will be slower. Um, interference will also make things worse. So if there's like quite a few walls between you and the um, router, then um, obviously it will be slower. Connection type, wired or wireless. So wired is literally the best. Everyone knows it's wired is the best. Um, I think I'll focus on this a bit later, but wired is just generally more stable. There's higher speeds. Wireless is um, basically just a lot worse because there's much more interference. Hardware. Yes, yeah, so you need to know about transmission media. So there's like three types of cables you need to know about. You need to know about fiber optic. You need to know about... I'll answer all questions at the end. You need to know about twisted pair and you need to know about... Uh, there's like a, a metallic one like a copper metallic one and you need to know about like interference and stuff i won't be able to have i don't have enough time to cover it um but you do need to know about it so if you have a cgp guide you're going to have to look at them cool wireless access point so in when you're connecting to networks there's um the specific subsection of the spec says you need to know about hardware when connecting to networks so one piece of hardware we need is a wireless access point so with a router um this is usually built in so we see these things over here these send out like the radio waves but um, yeah, basically what it is, is it sends out radio waves and creates a wireless access point. So without them, the phone cannot connect, the, uh, connect to your Wi-Fi. But with them, because of the radio waves, you can connect to the Wi-Fi. So the wireless access point basically creates, uh, sends out w uh, radio waves to create a, um, uh, like a Wi-Fi which you can connect to. A switch. So these are also usually built into routers nowadays. Like, you know, your modem has like everything built in. But um, a switch is where the different devices that you're using can connect to via um, a cable. And it pretty much just like organizes all the data. So all the data is coming in and out. It just organizes all of that. And we'll get into that a little bit later. It uses MAC addresses. Um, I don't know why this also says wireless access point, but this is a router. So I'm using the same image because most of the time everything is built in nowadays. So the router, the wireless access point, and the switch is all usually built into one. But the router basically transmits data between networks. So a switch just gets all the data in the network and connects it all together. But um, a router does it between networks. Network interface card. Now you guys probably don't even realize this, but these are built into computers. Usually they're built into the, mo um, the motherboard or the computer. And you need the network interface card to connect to networks. You need a network interface card to connect to networks. You need to remember that. Cool. Uh, transmission media. Yes, so these are like copper cables or whatever. 
um, different, um, well, you need transmission media to connect because you can either connect through radio waves because it's wireless or you can connect through actual, um, modem is like an old fashioned term, yeah. And, or you can connect through like fiber optic. Cool. So as we looked at earlier, these are the five separate things, um, the hardware that you need to connect standalone computers to a LAN. So LAN is a local area network. This is where devices are connected over a small geographical area to share data. So the switch is where you have like this, um, you have like this hub and data and the computers can be connected to it and like different devices can be connected to it and it sort of organizes everything. So um, it connects devices on LAN and it sends incoming data to the correct device based on MAC address. So let's say um, we're going to use a random example here. This is not an actual MAC address. So let's say you have five different phones. It goes one, two, three, four, five. When data is received by the router, it's transmitted to the switch. The switch says, okay, this data is going to number one. This data is going to number three. This data is going to number two, etc." Um, and router, so that sends data across a network in packets. So a switch connects everything on the network and then um, it sends it to the router and then the router connects different networks around the world. So our routers at home, so your router at home is sending um, this data to like YouTube or whatever. Uh, network interface card, NIC, that's just a hardware which is needed to connect to a network. You need it. Uh, that also assigns MAC addresses, but you don't really need to know that. Transmission media, wireless and wired. So when it's wireless, you have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Bluetooth is very, very old. Um, switch does not connect LAN to WANs. Um, and then wired, obviously you have, um, you have fiber optic cables, coaxial cables. Yeah, that's what I meant. So fiber optic, coaxial, and twisted pair. Wireless access point, finally, creates a wireless network by sending out radio waves. Cool. The internet, DNS. So DNS is a domain name server. And what it does is it converts a URL into an IP address. So URL, as we have the example at the bottom, is just like the actual name of something. So google.co.uk. So it makes it easy for the user because we can just search in a name. But um, is why it's meant to be Ethernet. No, okay. So there's a slight issue here. Let's go back a little bit actually because this is something I should, probably should address. Wired. So um, with wired cables, it's Ethernet, yeah. But the transmission media, which are like the actual methods of transmission, could either be fiber, uh, fiber optic cables, coaxial cables, or twisted pair cables. But Ethernet is like the general protocol. So everything wired is Ethernet. Cool. So yeah, so uh, you search google.co.uk, and once you do this, um, the browser sends a request to the DNS server, and it basically says, hey, I've got this domain. I want the IP address for it. Can you find it for me? So the URL is transferred to the DNS server. The DNS server then looks through its server to try and find the matching IP address. And once it found, once it is found, it's transferred back. So if you search google.co.uk, the, uh, the DNS server returns the IP address 172.217.14.195. And obviously it changes based on domain. But yeah, if a full marker comes up, that's um, pretty much what it is. Computer size is confusing. Um, just watch some YouTube videos after this and it should help out too. I'm trying to speed run this. So um, yeah, just to confirm, the user enters a URL into the address bar. So we enter google.co.uk. The browser then sends a request for the URL's matching IP address to the DNS server. The DNS then searches for it and looks through its server to try and find the matching IP address. Then once it finds the matching IP address, it returns it to the web browser and we can access the web page. So um, yeah, here's an example here. You enter bbc.co.uk, goes to the do domain name server. So this is like, you can imagine this is like um, a giant hard drive, I don't know. And it looks through the hard drive and it finds the matching um, IP address and it returns it so you can access the website. The cloud. So there's two different things you need to know about hosting and the cloud. So hosting is where files from one business are stored on another business's servers. So for example, um, Google, Google have a thing called Google Drive. Let's say you have a business, which is like a hairdresser's. You store um, all the client's data on a text file and you upload it to Google Drive. That's hosting because they are hosting your file. The cloud, um, that's just a term for uh, a service where you can pay or it's even sometimes free. Uh, to store files on a remote server. So for example, Google Drive, that's a form of the cloud. You have OneDrive, Dropbox, Mega, those different file holding things. Cool. So now we have the actual cloud. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the cloud? The advantages is that you can access um, the file from anywhere if you have Wi-Fi. Um, you can access it from any device if you have Wi-Fi. You don't need to buy expensive hardware 
and it's cheaper to upgrade the storage. So um, hardware and upgrading storage is sort of linked because if you want to upgrade from like one terabyte to two terabytes, you either have to buy a two terabyte hard drive or you have to buy another one terabyte one. Whereas with the cloud, your monthly fee just increases. But the disadvantage is that the monthly fee, a monthly fee can get very high and in the long term, it will probably end up costing more. Um, another disadvantage is that it's um, they're susceptible to hackers because if it's stored in the cloud, um, yeah, your file is just more susceptible to hackers because um, if it's physical, then they need actual physical access to um, the data. But if it's online, then it's obviously a lot easier. Also, um, another con is that it all depends on the host for security. So if you store your files on Google Drive, you're all depending on Google to make sure your file doesn't get leaked. And another disadvantage is that you need Wi-Fi to access it. Uh, Ollie's back, thank God. Ollie, you need to clean up the chat, please, if you can. Um, okay, so the three use of cloud services, so the three things that the cloud can do. So there's file storage, processing power, and software. So as we mentioned earlier, this is one of the main things, file storage. So you can store your files in the cloud, like Google, Google Drive or OneDrive. So you can store your files there, they'll store it for you, and you can access it if you have Wi-Fi. Processing power is another one, and that's where you basically... Let's say you have um, a fat piece of code. You've made like some mad code, but it requires a lot of processing power to actually run it. You can pay someone to use their computer to do it. And finally, software. You can access software over the cloud, so like remote stuff. Okay, um, web server and client. So how does accessing a website work? So we looked at URL um, earlier and DRS, DNS, DNS, yeah. Um, and um, it's sort of similar. So basically how it works is we're the client and we're using a computer. We're um, using a web browser. And when we go to google.co.uk and we click enter, our web browser sends a request to the web server. The web server then checks that we have authority to access this website. So with Google, everyone has authority to access it. And if we do have that authority, then it returns the web page. So that's literally how it works. It's a client server network. So we, we request it, the server checks if we're allowed to have it, and then it gives it to us if we're allowed. So here we have it here, we request it, and then the server gives it back. Modes of connection, here we go. So Ethernet, so someone mentioned earlier they're a bit confused, but um, yeah, there's Ethernet, DRS, uh, pro probably watching the race later. Um, Ethernet, so we have different cables, there's fiber optic, there's pet, <clears throat> there's um, coaxial, there's twisted pair, and then we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So you need to know the advantages and disadvantages of all of these. So the advantage of Ethernet, Ethernet is wired. So the advantage is that it's better performance all the time because if it's a wire, you don't have to rely on like signal. You don't, you don't really get um, interference. Signal quality always remains strong. It's more stable, there's less interference. Disadvantage is that it's more expensive. So if you have a wireless access point, all devices can access it easily. You can just like go on your phone, click on Wi-Fi and just connect. But if you need wires for each device, it will obviously add up. It's also less convenient because you can't be like walking around the house with just one cable always um, attached. Okay, now, um, advantages of Wi-Fi, you have many users when you're using your Wi-Fi. Um, you can have, like, some Wi-Fi's have, like, hundreds of users, and you can just connect to that fine. Um, it's more convenient. You can move around. You don't need a cable constantly attached to you. And finally, it's cheaper because you don't need cables. Um, the disadvantage, it's less stable. Um, there's quite a lot of issues when using wireless networks. There's a lower signal quality because, obviously, you're further away, and there's lower performance. Uh, there's greater, like, interference and stuff. There's walls, etc. Bluetooth, um, I can't do ICT, sorry. So um, Bluetooth is where you're connected with uh, two different devices only. You can't have multiple devices on Bluetooth, which is a bit of a shame. Um, there's low bandwidth. Bluetooth is a bit show. I'm not meant to swear. Bluetooth is a bit terrible overall, and it connects over a short connection range. Um, and you're, it's often used with like devices like watches and stuff like that. Um, you, you're going to need to know that, so you might have to make flashcards on this later. Encryption, you do need to know about encryption. So it's a form of security and encryption is where data is scrambled so that it's unreadable without a key. So we have a little diagram here. So we have plain text. So this could be like a letter to your mum. You encrypt it and then it just comes up with like random letters which you can't understand. The only way you can like understand this is if you decrypt it. And the way you need to decrypt it is using a key. So once you encrypt something, you get a key. Okay, that, that was literally all of encryption. That's literally all you need to know. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm leaving this on my channel. Okay, IP addressing. 
So an IP address is a unique address assigned to each router. So you can find your IP address by Googling what is my IP address and you will get it. And each person's router has an IP address. Every single one has an IP address. And it's basically like our number that the entire world can see, a public IP address. So Google sees that this user wants to access our website and it gives them, their, uh, it gives them our IP address. Why are IP addresses used? Um, networks use this to send data packets to the correct recipient. So if Google wants to send us um, a website file, no, what is that, a website file? If Google wants to send us a file, um, it needs to make sure we're the correct person. So it uses our IP address to send it. So it says, okay, I want to send um, this file to Danny. This is Danny's IP address. Let me send it here. Mac address. This is slightly different. A Mac address is more focused. So IP address is focused on the wider world. Mac address is sort of focused on your individual network. So as we mentioned earlier, the router connects us to the entire world and the switch connects the different devices in the smaller LAN. So with the switch, it receives data and it sends data based on the MAC address. So after receiving um, the data, let's say the file that we talked about earlier, after the file is transferred from Google to our router, the router sends it to the switch and then the switch sees um, who wants this data. So if it's iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 3, iPhone 4, iPhone 5. So with these five iPhones, you need to see which one we're talking about and which one like requested the data and it is sent over there. So if it was iPhone 4, iPhone 4, if it was iPhone 4, then the data is sent to that iPhone. So a MAC address is like, yes, yeah, unique. It's an hexadecimal number. You need to know it's hexadecimal. And every network interface card has one. So as I mentioned earlier, you need a network interface card to connect to a network. And that's one of the reasons why. Um, two types of IP addresses, IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4 is uh, the most common, it's Denary. IPv6 um, is more new, you don't really see it that much. But it's created because apparently we're running out of IPv4, which I haven't really noticed, but yeah. Um, IPv6 is 128-bit, which is huge, and it's a hexadecimal, so we won't run out of that. Okay, IP addressing and MAC addressing. Um, this is IPv4, this is IPv6. I just thought I'd show you, that's what IPv6 looks like, this is what IPv4 looks like. Standards, you just need to know the definition. A standard are a set, a set of agreed requirements for manufacturers that ensures all devices can communicate with one another. That's pretty much it. Um, a protocol is a set of rules. Okay, you need to know all of these. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry to scare you, but you need to know all of these. Um, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. That's all I'm pretty much going to say because it's not even hard to understand. You just need to know all of these. So POP, IMAP, and SMTP, those are like emails. <laughs> and um, yeah, you just need to know all of these. HTTP is accessing websites. It's pretty much a memory game, this. I can't lie. And a protocol is a set of rules. That's I think that's almost done. Yeah, networks is pretty much done. But yeah, you need to know these. Yeah, it is easy. It's literally just flashcards. You, you, but yeah. Okay, cool. Common uh, protocols aren't in the advanced information. I'm pretty sure they are. I'm pretty sure they are. But I will look into it. Cool. A layer. A layer is a division of network functionality. L uh, layers are not appearing in the exam. So, um, or unless they're like a low tariff question. You, okay, if whoever's saying that layers are appearing in the exam, you're doing the wrong exam board, I think. So just be careful. Everyone's saying that layers are appearing. Hold on, wait, what are you talking about? Protocols are layers. No, I'm going to get my advanced information up so none of you can trick me anymore. Okay, because you guys have scared me too much. Yeah, okay, standards are appearing, but layers are not appearing. Great. You don't have to know about layers, but standards are appearing. So you need to know about modes of connection, which we covered, encryption we've covered, IP addressing and MAC addressing we've covered, standards we've covered, and protocols we've covered just now. We're almost done, you know? We're almost done. And I'm going to get into exam advice. Cool. Yeah, but layers are not appearing on the exam. Cool. Uh, common prevention methods. So, hold on, I just like, okay, yeah. So with security, we want to try and prevent people from attacking our network, obviously. This is similar to like viruses in biology. But um, one of the ways we can do this is penetration testing. So it's pretty simple. You can just remember testing. Like, okay, this is just testing the network. They simulate, uh, they stimulate, stimulate, they simulate a network attack to try and spot vulnerabilities. So you pay people to act as hackers to try and hack into your network. And then they find like vulnerabilities in your network and then they fix them for you. So basically, you pay people to dress up as hackers. Cool. Anti-malware software. Um, it says what it does. 
it just prevents malware. So it scans files, and if it sees that malware, it quarantines it. So you guys know what quarantine means because of COVID, but it quarantines the file, so it separates it, so it can't do anything. And then it gives the user the opportunity to either delete it or keep it, and most of the time it'll delete. Common prevention methods are firewalls. We have a lovely little diagram here. A firewall just prevents unauthorized access to a network. So it monitors incoming data, and if there's like a random file which is coming from some random network or some random computers trying to connect to you, it will obviously block it. User access levels. So this is where different users are given different levels of authority. Um, so each user can access a different section of files based on their authority. We have an example here. So um, students can access like their study files or their homework, but teachers can access like data on the students. They can ac they can find out the students' age. They can find out where they live. But students obviously can't do that because if you could, if one student could find out where another student lives, that's very dangerous. Uh, passwords. So um, passwords. Everyone knows about passwords. They're prevention method because it means you need to know a secret word or phrase or whatever to access an account. Um, you can limit the number, the max number of password attempts. This is a very, very good point to put in exams. So if you stick a limit of five, then um, it makes sure that people who don't know the password will not get access. A strong password is long and has many types of characters. Okay, cool. Encryption. So as we mentioned earlier, encryption scrambles data so it's unreadable without a key. And the advantage of this is even if hackers steal data, they won't be able to read it because it's encrypted and they won't have the key. Physical security. So you have server rooms. You have these huge server rooms with these huge computers and stuff like that in buildings. If you lock the door, that's security. That boom. It's literally like two marks. Easy money. Uh, I'll explain the advanced information stuff at the end because um, I think there is a bit of confusion in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, the four different types of issues which you need to know about. Ethical, legal, cultural. Sorry, five. Ethical, legal, cultural, environmental, privacy. Once again, it's just common sense. Ethical is what's right or wrong. Legal is things which are against the law and what's not. Cultural are how things affect different groups, so different cultures of people. Environmental is stuff affecting our, envi affecting our environment. And privacy is things affecting our privacy. Okay, so with this, there is a big advantage. I did not talk about phishing and social engineering. Uh, okay, so with this, there is a big advantage um, because it basically what the examiners are saying is with the eight mark questions, which always appear at the end of the exam, they're basically testing students wider knowledge. So students who really know about computer science will really be able to prosper. So if you know if so for privacy, let me give you some good points to talk about, actually, because this is stuff that I always talk about. If the question asks you about privacy, I always talk about um, how companies are stealing our data. So you should research it like Facebook and stuff like that. They sell our data. Environmental, uh, learn some statistics because that will really impress an examiner. Because uh, if you learn how much waste is being dumped each year, that'll be really good. Cultural, uh, that's just how things affect different groups. You can waffle quite a bit. Legal, um, you need to know about the laws, which I'm going to look at in literally a second. And finally, ethical, that's just right or wrong. Um, it's pretty much common sense. Fratness, okay, so Data Protection Act 2018, you need to know about this. Um, I use an acronym, Fratness, to remember this. And, um, it basically stands for fair, relevant, accurate, necessary, time, safe, specific purpose. So fair, the data must be processed fairly. Relevant, only relevant data should be uh, collected. Accurate, only accurate data must be collected. Necessary time, data should not be kept for longer than necessary. Safe, the data must be kept safe. And specific purpose, the data must have a specific purpose. If you go around collecting people's like eye colour, then that's a bit odd. You need to memorise this, so I'd recommend using the acronym. Um, Computer Misuse Act 1990. Um, computers Committed to Change, that's another acronym. I think that, that means acronym. But um, firstly, uh, you're not allowed unauthorized access to a computer. Secondly, another crime is unauthorized access to a computer in order to commit a crime. And finally, unauthorized modification of computer material. So down here, we have an example. So uh, unauthorized access to your computer is where you're going to run a person's computer in the library. An authorized access to a computer in order to commit a crime is where you go on that person's computer and you steal their money. And finally, an authorized modification of computer material is where you delete their file. Do you have to memorize the date? Okay, yeah. Um, for J276, you did have to, so I would recommend this as well. And it's very easy, so I'd probably go for it. Digital divide, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we covered that. Copyright Patterns and Design Act 1988. 
Suck is banned. That's the acronym I used. So sharing, using, claiming. So sharing copyrighted material is banned. Using unlicensed software is banned. And claiming copyrighted material as your own is banned. So this stuff you're just going to need to memorize once again. Open source, the advantages and disadvantages. So open source is where the code is freely available. So Microsoft Word, imagine if all the code which is written to like make that was freely available. That's what source code um, is. Like source code is the code for those applications. The advantages is it's basically always free. There's a website called GitHub, which has all the open source code usually. Um, you can make your own spin-off software. So for example, um, yeah, we can talk on Discord after the stream. So um, let's say Microsoft Word did go available. You could make your own version of Microsoft Word, which is specific to you. And a lot of businesses do this. They get like open source code then they pay someone to just like make a specific version, which is just based on that. And finally, popular software has a lot of add-ons, which can be useful. Anki is open source. Um, <laughs> that's pretty cool. But um, they have a lot of add-ons, which is cool. Disadvantages of open source. Um, other companies can use the same programs you use. So if someone knows you're using like Microsoft Word, which we're now saying is open source, um, then they might use it too, which is just like a bit scary because um, they can just use the stuff you're using and they can just like cling on to you. Secondly, there's less customer support because no one's being paid or anything. It's all free. Then there's no like people that you can ring up for help. Um, and that's especially important with businesses because they need like instant help. Uh, third, there's no warranties. It's open source. It's totally free. There isn't a warranty because you're not paying for anything. And finally, it's more susceptible to exploits because if the source code is fully available, then um, it's a lot easier to find ways to like go around it. Cool. Examples. I don't know if you need to know examples or not. I'm going to look. Out, I'm going to check after this. But um, I'm going to edit this video and upload it properly in a bit. Um, but yeah, Linux, Firefox, VLC, it's open source. Proprietary software. So this is the main software that everyone knows. And that's where the source, called, uh, so source code is not freely available. So games like FIFA, games like Minecraft, the source code is not available. So it's just an executable file. The advantages is that because you have to pay for these, because it's not available freely. Um, well, you usually have to pay for them. Not always. Not always. Uh, pronounce Linux, lovely. Why are people confused? Okay, I'm not going to get back to that subject. Um, yeah, the advantage is that there are warranties and you can get customer support. Uh, support. It's also more reliable um, because people like their, their jobs, their livelihood is working on this software. And finally, it's cheaper than building new software from scratch. Um, so a company might want to build their own new software, but they can just pay to use someone else's software. Uh, the disadvantage is you must pay most of the time, not all of the time. Um, it must match the needs of the. It might not match the needs of the business, and finally, it might not work with old, um, old software. Okay, there's a slight hindrance in the chat once again, so we might need to put that to a rest. Good, cool. Um, almost. Oh, wait, is that it? Oh no, we just need to know examples. So yeah, paid games, Microsoft Office, and Windows. Boom. Oh, okay. So we finished all the content, guys. Um, I'm really sorry about like um, the maths issue. Uh, I'm going to edit that and I'm going to make, I'm going to post this as an actual video so you can like re go over that bit tomorrow or something. I'm going to try and get that done tonight. But yeah, guys, how long did that take us? Let me see what time it is. Uh, it took us about an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah I'm going to upload this slide as soon as um, I'm, uh, this is done. But it took us about an hour and a half to cover everything, which I'm pretty gassed about. You do need to know about open source and proprietary. You do need to know about open source proprietary. Cool. Um, yeah, exams. So paper one. Here's some advice for paper one. Uh, paper two, I'll, uh, I'll do like in another few days. How do you know 85% is a nine? Okay, so in past papers and stuff that's been done, it, it will be 85% for a nine. It will be 85%. I'm pretty certain. It'll be roughly 85. It, sometimes it gets higher. Um, do some paper two. Okay, I'll probably do paper two. If I get 65 in each paper, I'll be set for a nine. Yeah, probably. So is defragmentation in or not? I'll check that in a minute. I'll do paper two soon. I can't do it now. I don't have enough time. Um, okay, yeah. Definitions are very important with paper one. They often ask like one marker, two marker for definitions. Be specific and concise. Also, also very, very important point. Very important point. Contextualized. In the mark scheme, it's specifically said that your answers, if they're not contextualized, you don't get the mark. So if it's asking about the advantages of open source software for a large law firm, then you need to contextualize it to a large law firm. What's taking it? Okay, I'm going to look at the um, advanced information one second. I'll get it up on the screen. Um, eight markers is almost always ethics. Uh, do wider reading if you can to use like 
I know, to have extra knowledge to impress the examiner. But, oh yeah, also to get the full eight marks, what you need to do is you need to separate it into paragraphs. You need to separate your answer to paragraphs. So if it's asking you to talk about cultural issues and privacy issues, you need to separate it into two separate paragraphs. 85% is a nine. It is tough. Cool, paper two. For section A, you must use OCR reference language, which is terrible. Simply put, it is terrible. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have to use it. Each paper is out of 80. Um, you need to learn the correct syntax. So the syntax is basically just like the wording. So like for I in range or whatever. Um, thirdly, you need to go through mark schemes because it's always the same stuff uh, for paper two. For paper two, um, the questions are asked. It's always just repeated. I can't lie. Like the actual programming that you have to do will be different, obviously. But the actual like questions about like interpreters, the theory of paper two is easy. Um, you can use any language for um, section B. Yeah, no, for section A, you have to use OCR reference language. But for section B, um, you can use... Um, for section B, you can use... Is an exam reference language or code that you've learned? Yeah, section B, you can use um, code that you've learned. So you can use Python and stuff. But for section A, you can only use OCR reference language. Okay, um, section B is any language. And you can even use flowcharts, actually. And flowcharts can sometimes use OCR reference language. If you don't know what that is, then that's a bit concerning. Um, but yeah, OCR reference language is like pseudocode sort of. That might might be what your teachers taught uh, you as. I don't know when I'll go over paper two. I'll let you know on TikTok. Uh, finally, don't be afraid to use flowcharts if needed. Sometimes flowcharts is easier. And none of us has even learned the reference language. Write an algorithm for section A. Yeah, no, in section A, okay, I'm going to get up in a minute. But section A, you need to use OCR reference language. I'm pretty certain. Cool. Exam prep. So, how can you practice for the exam? YouTube videos, if you don't understand a concept. Um, you know, I'll answer all the questions in a minute. YouTube videos, if you don't understand a concept. Flashcards for last minute memorization. Only make flashcards on the stuff that's really important. Because it's very, very risky using flashcards now. You should mostly be practicing. Our exams are in a week. Our exams are in a week. Uh, Craig and Dave is very important. Don't do bullet points for the A markers. I don't know if you're allowed to, but I would not risk it. Um, yeah, grind past papers, get your friends to quiz you, and exam workbooks can be useful because there aren't that many past papers. Um, is that everything? There, boom. Okay, that's the PowerPoint done. Now let's um, get this up on the screen. I'm going to get the advanced information up on the screen. Is this it? Okay, cool. So, um, what's covered? So we covered the purpose of the CPU. We, covers, uh, we covered common CPU components and their features. We covered von Neumann. We covered primary storage. We covered secondary storage. We covered units. We covered data storage. We covered compression. We did all of networks. We did all of wired and wireless networks, protocols, and layers. Layers are not appearing. Layers are not appearing. Um, common prevention methods we did. And 1.6.1 we did. Now, let's look at this. This is no advanced... Okay, yes, yeah, so for paper two, there's no advanced information. Uh, it is advised that to cover the entire subject. Yeah, okay, so I'm pretty certain... Okay, we may have been wrong when we decided earlier. There won't be low tariff questions. No, that, yeah, no. As you mentioned, I don't think there'll be low tariff questions. I'm not sure for certain... But it says here, subparts of topic that will be directly assessed. Directly assessed. It says directly. Why does it use the word directly? These lot are playing mind games, you know. The exam boards are playing mind games. They're specifically... Oh, genuinely, genuinely, I can't come to a solid confusion. I'll answer the questions in a minute. I can't, I can't come to a solid decision whether it's going to appear or not. Because directly assessed, it doesn't talk about synoptic. You should consider how you revise for other parts, for example, to review whether other topics might provide knowledge for your help in areas being tested in 2022. This makes me think that the advanced information will be the only stuff assessed. Or if we go down, this makes me think it won't be. You know, what? I'm just not going to advise. I'm not going to revise the stuff that's not on here. Because realistically, even if it is a linked question, it'll only be a very low amount of marks and you should be able to scam your way through it. That is quite annoying, though. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, we covered that. Okay, what are the questions? I'm going to speed run these questions. 
customer support center. That'd be sick. <laughs> um, what's in my revision folder? What is this? Just different like stuff which I need to use to revise. See cognito, um, German vocab, science, history, English. I don't know. Um, any questions? Go through it now. I'm British. Yeah, I am. I'm born in Britain. I'm in year eleven. OCR is terrible. Yeah, layers I don't really like, but it is what it is. Any questions, burn through them now, by the way. Which anime do I watch? You know, what? I've got my manga right over there. Which websites or things can I use to practice Python? Okay, uh, join my Discord server and message, message me directly. I will send you a um, programming document, which I use um, to learn Python. How do you, oh, hold on. Let me also look at whether um, you need to know an, uh, know OCR reference languages or not. Uh, show us what you did for your programming. What you did for your programming. What do you mean? Are you prepared for exam? I, I feel quite prepared. Uh, is there somewhere you can get past paper questions on a specific topic? Not for computer science. Geofragmentation. Defragmentation is where you reduce fragmentation in a hard drive. So hard drive. Oh, how can I describe this? You know what? Let me get an, an image up. Okay, so, okay, oh, this looks terrible. I can't really explain it well. Okay, but um, fragmentation is where bits of the same file are separated. So you have file one and you have file two. No, let, you have three files. File one, file two, file three. Um, file one is here. File two is here. Oh, God, this is going to be so terrible. And file three is here. Now, if you delete file two and delete file one. Oh, shit. Okay, sorry for swearing. I can't really explain this that well. You might need to just watch a YouTube video because I can't do this graphically. But it's basically, defragmentation is where bits of the same file are put together so it's faster to read and write. Um, past papers for computer science and business studies, you can use AQA, you can use Revision World. How much should you revise a day? You should do a few hours. Um, in Section 8, it says writing algorithms, so you don't have to write an OCR reference language. Okay, yeah, let me check that. So... It should say this on the specification. Okay. Um, I'll say this towards the bottom, I think. Okay, here we go. Practical programming. Where does it say this? Okay, hold on. Say, so, say, section A. Do, do, do. Okay, let's, let me answer some questions while I'm waiting. Do you get nervous? I'm very nervous. Networking. Can you send the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll upload it straight away. How do you practice coding? I literally just by doing uh, coding questions. Discord link. Uh, Ollie's put it on the chat. Unit test for business. I don't have that. I don't think defragmentation is coming up. Um, uh, Python ID. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, thanks if you found this useful. I really appreciate it. How do you know Harry Davies? How do you know Harry Davies? I, I don't know how you've seen that, but sure. How do you advise for literature for a nine? Uh, literature, I use flashcards. I'll upload it. Um, uh, okay, so the link for this PowerPoint, I'll put it in the description of this video and I'll also put it on my Discord. Um, I'm just going to confirm now. Okay, here we go. Section A. Oh, I've goofed again. Okay, you yeah, know, with J277, they did change it. You can use English or you can use a high uh, level programming language. No worries. I appreciate it. Thanks for finding this useful. It's good. Uh, How do your French speaking go? I take uh, German. I take German speaking and it was fine. It was right. Um, how do you advise for language? I don't know if you're talking about GCSE English language or German language. If it's German, then vocab is fine. Um, if it's English language, then practice. Um, okay, yeah, no, my, my apologies. I don't think... I don't think you need OCR reference language. Students report OCR reference. Okay, you need to be able to understand it, but you don't need to be able to answer using it. I did fast in the day of my speaking exam, which was a bit it was a bit tough. My math did get quite dry. Operating systems and utility systems has been taken out. You guys are too nice. You guys are actually too nice. Feeling more confident now. Oh, that's that's a relief. 
Get your questions in, because I want to answer as many as I can. If I could help out, that would be pretty cool. So we'll get them in. Okay, yeah, so just to confirm, I'm going to update this video. You can use a high-level language. Okay, no, okay, so you can't use it for the entire paper. So for section A, you can use it. For section B, you can only use it for writing and refining code. You can't use it for testing and designing. But you can use natural English, which is pretty weird. What are you filling in the gaps in OCR? Yeah, apparently, well, Luke, I, I think we'll ask Brownie about it, but it's a bit weird. Um, where can I find the business crash course? It should already be uploaded. If it isn't, I'll like mess a few things around and I will get it uploaded. Do you recommend physics and math tutor notes? Physics and math tutor has single-handedly saved my English grade. Okay, cool. Um, faster 10 hours during the art speaking exam. Damn. Do you know anywhere to get predicted papers for science for free? Predicted science papers are all in my Discord, so join. It's all in my Discord. There's a guy called Study, Study Hack, and he made predicted papers, which, and it's free. Free. So sick. Um, check the 2020. Okay, cool. Do you need to know the internet in terms of its services? Um, uh, let me get the spec up. So, uh, advanced information is here. Doo -doo -doo. Oops, I've scrolled a bit too far. Too close. To okay, the internet is a worldwide collection of computer networks. So, let's find where the internet was. Oops. Oh, you know what? This is so slow. It's terrible. And let me answer questions. How do you revise for paper two programming? You just need to practice programming. Um, you need to make flashcards on some of the stuff, though. Um, where am I from? Oh, yeah, someone asked where I'm from. So I'm from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, all three countries. My lineage is pretty interesting, actually. It's, from, uh, it's quite um, all over the place. Okay, here we go. Here we go. The internet. Uh, how do you guys know I'm from Milton Keynes? Shush, shush. Um, science predictive papers is all on my Discord. Okay, stop asking. Stop repeating questions, please. Operating systems have been taken out. And utility systems. Okay, where is the internet? Um, so yeah, here we go. The internet is a worldwide collection of computer networks. So with the internet, these are the only four things you need to know about DNS, hosting, the cloud and web service and clients. How do you revise architecture? Uh, hold on. What does it mean by answering in natural English in section A? It wouldn't be too easy. Yeah, apparently you can. It says you can. I, I'm going to look through the spec tonight and like sort of come to a conclusion. How do I join the discord? There's a link which has been put in the chat by Luke. How do you revise architecture? What architecture? I can't draw for my life. I can draw you like a stick band and that's by it. So I don't really know. Um, any other questions, get them in. What time is it? We've got about uh, 10 minutes till eight. I'll probably leave a little bit earlier because I did cover things quite quickly. Okay, good stuff. Systems architecture. Oh, oh, damn. He meant systems architecture. My bad, my bad. Um, a lot of it is memorizing. Fetch your code executes memorizing. Registers is memorizing. Components is memorizing. I think that's it. But yeah, you should just use flashcards, to be honest. What specs do you have? What specs do I have? Is he talking about my computer? Are you going to do any more crash courses? I might do paper two. This was uh, paper one. Um, I think this was fine, but at the beginning I did mess up a little bit, which I'm quite sad about, but... I do FSMQ, uh, Python document. Yeah, that's going to be on my Discord. Join my Discord. I will put everything on my Discord. Message me directly if you want or use the hashtag. My PC spec reveal. Okay, you, you know what? Go on. Okay, so I've got an i7, 5400 old. I've got, you know what? There we go. I've got an RTX 3060. I funded this using TikTok money, actually. It's pretty sick. Um, I got this recently, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, yeah, I've got like 16 gigs of RAM. It's, it's not too good of a PC. This just carries it. Um, yeah, okay, I'll do paper two. How many pass papers do I do a day? Like two, maybe three? Cheeky set. I'm not showing you my setup, sadly. It'll be too, like, hard to do right now. And it's so, it's terrible. Uh, this is OCR. What CPU? RTX. <laughs> my, is my stream lagging? Oh, no. It's because I'm using, um, my laptop to do this. Okay, yeah, hold on, yeah, let me let me quit, quickly pin this. Pin message. Okay, Discord link has been pinned. What games do I play? Not really relevant to GCSE, but I play like... Um, 
Fortnite. No, I'm joking. Um, I play like story based games. I played Control. I played um, uh, Cyberpunk stuff like that. How much money are you getting from TikTok? I'm definitely go not going to disclose that. I have my tenth exams, but it's more interesting. Great. Um, how long have you been revising and doing past papers? Uh, two to three past papers a day in the past like two three weeks. Um, can you do crash courses for other subjects? I think paper two computer science I might do. Can't tell you my Is A level computer science a lot harder than this? I'm in year eleven. So I don't know. But I think I've been told that A level computer science is calm. I am taking it. Show us your FIFA team. I would I don't play FIFA this year though. I didn't I just didn't buy it. I one of the best decisions I made this year was getting rid of my PlayStation. Um I don't play many games, but I I just have it because like it's fun and Minecraft shaders. My Anki Streak. Oh, my Anki streak is devious. Oh, you know, I ignore that. But, like, my Anki streak is very good. It's, like, 257. Um, any other questions? I think I'm going to end the stream in a few minutes. What mic is that? I've got a pseudo attack. Pseudo attack. It's a... You probably don't know of it. But I think it's decent quality. So... Do you have any predictive papers for computer science? No. Do you have Discord... Does your Discord have any other predictive papers other than AQA? I don't think so. Is there still a project for A-level? Yes. How much money is in my bank account? Why are you asking this? <laughs> Can you rap into the mic? Yo, yes, like... No, hold on, I'm not going to. Sorry. I'm not going to rap, sadly. Although I can sing. My singing is absolutely great. Notion. I'm going to use Notion for sixth form. I'm not using it for GCSEs. That's too overkill. <laughs> I say it's too overkill. It's, it's so good. Notion is incredible, but I just don't know how to use it. Where can I find business? How do you get full marks on the ethic question? Okay, business should be already uploaded. Uh, uploaded. Um, if it's not, I'll try and fix that. Um, how do you get full marks? You have to separate it into paragraphs. That's the main thing. Can you use J276 past papers for J277? Yes, absolutely. Um, who's your favourite music artist? Oh. The Smiths. They're my favourite. They're a band. A-level. Maths, further maths, computer science, physics, EPQ. Thanks for letting us know you're from India, but it's not really that relevant, bro. These are asking weird questions. Uh, do you have predictive papers for chemistry and physics? Yes, they're all in my server. They're all in my server. So join my server. I won't be doing this for English. I'm not strong enough in English to do this. I feel like it's not really like, I don't know. What channel just called you uploading the PowerPoint to? Uh, I don't know. I'll probably put it in like, um, yeah, I will be stressed at A-level. I'm pretty much accepting death. Um, I want to be a computer, probably a software engineer or something. Um, if you have any questions related to computer science, that'd be a bit better because this is like your last opportunity before exams to ask me questions. A very unique opportunity, actually. How can you make flashcards? How can you make flashcards on a no faster? Don't know what that means. What's predictor papers? Uh, papers that are, um, well, papers that they predict are, like, predict are going to appear, I don't know. Questions would say predicts are going to appear and they put it in the paper. Uh, cool, same A levels. Five A levels. It's four and a half. Yeah, Luke, I'll unban you. I'll unban you. <laughs> uh, how do you learn loops? Loops are like the easiest thing. There's YouTube. Resources for paper two. YouTube. YouTube, 100%. And CGP. I can't do this for sciences. I'm not strong enough in science. Let's just go. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Would you recommend to do in exams in 10 days? Uh, okay, so exams are very near. It's a week and a day left until computer science. Okay, don't stress. First of all, I want to have a, like a heart to heart with you because I'm in the same boat as you. Try not to stress. Um, realize that before the exam, okay, work hard, obviously, do past papers. After the exam, even if you feel like you haven't done as good as you could have done, you just got to realize that you've done what you've done. Like there's there's no going back now, and um, you've worked as hard as you can. As long as you know that you've worked as hard as you can, then don't worry about the grade. Because at the end of the day, you've put a lot of effort into it. And I'm sure that you guys will all do fine because you're all very dedicated to, well, uh, to learning. So, yeah. Um, bit of a stupid question. Nothing's a stupid question. Uh, is English the only STEM subject where you get two separate grades? The only non-STEM subject, I think he means. But, um, yeah, I guess so. Are you selling your computer science flashcards? Probably after GCSEs. Uh, can you link 1.5 to any other topics? Don't think so. What's the hardest thing in Python? I don't know. YouTubers. Uh... For computer science, Craig and Dave. I'm pretty set for computer science, although this helped me as I don't know we needed to know about the cloud, so thanks. Okay, good stuff. Good luck, good luck. Um, hardest thing in programming? I don't know. How do you define a standard? A standard is a, a set of rules for communication. Yeah. 
no protocols are set of rules for communication a standard is like oh oh so a standard is a set agreed requirements um that devices need to follow and pretty much it means that devices from different manufacturers can interact with each other do you do any other subjects out of interest for these well obviously yeah, i do different gcses did you do any coding projects yeah um are you selling computer science flashcards not right now do you go to the gym yes could you give us your anki set sadly no but if others in year 10 do you have any ideas of what could help him if you're in year 10 then the best thing you can possibly do is make anki flashcards now i did it and it was the best decision i ever made um how do you define uh, layers layer is a division of network functionality i will re-upload this how do you add a while loop so it goes back to the start it's just there's the parameter for while you just need to make it false so if it's like while um continue equals true then you just turn it to false you saw me in milton Keynes once great which youtube channel do you recommend for computer science i'm in year nine but i want to be ahead of my class sigma male mentality uh mr brown cs and craig and dave uh yeah thanks luke thanks for helping out uh where do i find the predictor papers on your server uh they should be in the announcement section do you need to know common standards like html uh no you need to know http though and that stuff yeah year tens have to know everything rest up Layers have been taken off. Yes, I have. And the stream, bro, is getting useless for the most point. Oh, yeah, cheers. <laughs> okay, I'm probably going to end the stream now, actually. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope I've been able to help you guys. I do apologize for the issues earlier. I will fix this, and I'm going to upload the PowerPoint now to both my Discord and my YouTube description. There is a link to my Discord server pinned in the chat, so quickly join that if you want. If you have any questions, feel free to message me on Discord directly. And I really hope I've been able to help. Um, if you do have any other issues with computer science, consider checking out Craig and Dave, uh, Mr. Brown CS. They make really good videos. Your teachers are very valuable as well. And exams are in just over a week. So best of luck. Thank you very much. And see you in a bit. See ya.